Network Dojo. Authentications is definitely a, a pretty big subject here. Uh, it's a place where a lot of things can definitely go wrong. So we're going to step through as best as we can um, the different types of authentications and a lot of the different types of errors that would come along with it. So as you start to troubleshoot things, uh, things to try to pay attention to. So what type of authentication is it? You know, is it AO2.1x? Is it Mac-based authentication? Is it management-based authentication? If it's uh, AO2.1x, what protocol is it attempting to use? PEEP, EEP TLS, things that are tunneled, uh, tunneling protocols, what are the inner methods that they're trying to use? Which rule did it match? And this is authentication again. So which authentication rule did it match? Uh, we're, we're looking at things like verifying the allowed protocols list. We're looking at, uh, are we looking in the correct places to validate user credentials? We're looking at the actual credentials themselves. Are we missing the user account? Is the user account wrong? Bad password, things like that. And then we'll also give through trips through uh, troubleshooting specific protocols as well. So buckle up and let's go. So as you look at your auth logs, uh, again, you should know what type of an authentication it is attempting to use, and that's usually pretty obvious because when you connect to a WLAN, they'll tell you how your client is going to be connecting. So you know the basics, but um, being able to identify the information or at least write rules that can you know, differentiate between these things is, is a very helpful process. But these are the broad categories of authentications that we would typically interact with in the course of a lab. Uh, lots of different wireless stuff, AO2.1x, Mac filtering, and uh, web auth style logins. On the wired side, we do have the potential for wired AO2.1x or MAB with our AP authentications. And then there's management authentications that come in as well. And so you should hopefully understand you know, what these look like. So um, that's usually maybe not as important from a, uh, a troubleshooting standpoint, but definitely from a rule writing standpoint, it might help you there. So uh, those three parts of the authentication rule, and we talked about that when we talked about the auth logs, but we'll review, review that as well. Uh, we also look at that failure condition, which we didn't get into that. So let's get into that, um, and then we'll look at the allowed protocols list real quick, and then we're going to start getting into uh, some sp specific errors. So this is what things would look like when we have policy sets turned off. If we have policy sets turned on, we just get individual authentication policies for each policy set, but they all just have rules. And so when we connect up in the, the auth log, I guess I have to uh, scroll through it here. Again, the auth log has those three entries for the authentication policies. So the first one again is the policy set you were assigned to. And if policy sets are turned off, it just always says default. The second one is the authentication rule, the high level rule. And then the third entry is the identity store rule within the overall authentication rule. So as we look at that, again, I don't have policy sets turned on, so that first entry is always default. The second entry would be the names of these rules like mab.1x or default. And then the third would be within the rule that you match. So if I match the mab rule, the mab rule in this case has just one identity store rule, which is called default. And unless you are actually creating these yourselves, it's very unlikely that you would have more than just a default identity store rule uh, underneath your overall rule. But it's important that you understand, okay, when this auth hit, did it hit the rule that I anticipated it to hit? And then number two, as I potentially dive deeper into things, I am going to use the information within that rule to ferret out, you know, is, uh, am I using the allowed protocols list that I want? Am I looking in the places that I want? Because those are things that can cause problems in your authentication. But as you look at that rule, here is the allowed protocols list leveraged by the rule. Usually it's, there's just one that's there by default and that's usually all that we use. So it's unlikely that you would have more than one of those. And then here would be the identity stores that we're looking in. Now the identity store rule here has uh, some failure options or some some failure scenarios and the actions to take if we hit those failure scenarios and so there we see actually the three different potential actions right on this list here so a reject means that if we in this case if the authentication fails that would be you know like a password bad password would would be this use case we actually send back an explicit explicit rejection to the network device so the network device knows oh this auth failed and then it usually tells the client we can drop 
which means that we stop the authentication, but we do not send an authentication or a, an access reject. So there is nothing. It, it's just stop. Just stop it all. And now the network device hears nothing from us. And usually what happens is on the network device, it, it just times itself out because the radio server is no, wrong, lo, no longer responding to its communications. And then we have this continue option, which means even though something went wrong, because these are failure scenarios here, move on to the authorization phase anyways with whatever information we currently have. So the only place that this is ever set by default is in the MAB rule on if user is not found. And that's really for central web auth. So for central web auth, it's a Mac-based authentication, hence the MAB rule. And this is for guest endpoints. And so the, a guest endpoint, brand new guest coming onto our network, we've never seen it before. We're not going to pre-populate its MAC address. And so even if we don't find the MAC address, we're just going to let it, you know what, go to the authorization rules, and it should hopefully hit the appropriate central web auth rule over there. Now we can have other things do continue, but not everything allows for a continue. So for instance, 802.1x authentications. You're not allowed to actually do a continue if, you know, for instance, user not found or, or something like that. So our EAP types, it's not going to work. But for things like PAP ASCII, you know, which might be uh, a management-based authentication, uh, web auth style authentication come in as PAP ASCII, those could leverage continues on top of the MAC filtering, which also uses PAP ASCII as well by default. So those are the things that could actually support a continue. But um, just looking at what's happening will help you understand um, maybe why you're seeing some of the behavior that you're seeing. And so if somehow this got manipulated, and you know what, if user not found reject, and you know, it's hard to replicate this in the lab because you've already had the client probably testing other WLANs at this point. But in real world, you know, the first time a client connects and it gets rejected, that might not be what you want. So that is, uh, you know, just another thing to be aware of in terms of getting the full picture of, you know, why are things behaving the way that they're behaving. All right, so when we hit a rule, you know, if we're not hitting the rule that we want, we just have to troubleshoot the matching con conditions here. Now, because of the way that the rules are written by default, they're, they're pretty good. Most client Mac authentications, no, notice I said client Mac authentications, hit the MAB rule. So if it's Mac filtering on a WLAN on a controller, it'll hit MAB. If it's MAB enabled on a wired switch port, it'll hit MAB. But other Mac authentications like um, Mac authorizations don't hit the MAB rule. Dot one X pretty much hits every wired or wireless dot one X rule. So the only thing that doesn't hit the dot one X rule that's actually dot one X by default is if an autonomous AP is using ICE as its radius server based off of the default configurations, mind you, it will hit the default rule. So the default rule becomes our catch all. Every management auth is going to hit the default rule every time. Um, AP authorizations hit the MAB rule every time. Autonomous AP authorizations of any type hit the MAB rule. Or, sorry, the default rule. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. The default rule. What hits the default rule by default? MAC authorizations, management authentications, web auths, and anything coming from an autonomous AP. Those will always hit the default, default rule by default. So if you're, if you're not seeing the rule match that you expect, either it's the, the device is sending things formatted in a way that doesn't hit these matching criteria, or they've been manipulated. To somehow. And it's rare that you would see that these have been manipulated somehow. But if you ever want to see how it works, you can you know, hold your mouse over here. So what does wireless MAB look like? You click on it, normalize radius flow, flow equals wireless MAB. So ultimately, um, you know, something like this, and, and a lot of these things nowadays would ultimately depend on the network device profile. Since we're saying, you know, it looks like MAB, it looks like dot one X. Well, what does it mean? It looks like dot one X. Different vendors do di things differently. And so they created these things called network device profiles. And here we use the Cisco network device profile for everything. And so as we expand this out, so if the auth comes through a network device that is assigned to the Cisco network device profile, which is everything by default, this is how we 
look for it. So we're looking at a couple of entries to say, hey, this is a, a wired map. Hey, this is a wireless map. This is wired.1x. This is wireless.1x. Things like that. And that's how it's truly, actually, truly identifying, oh, this is a wireless map. This is a wired.1x, whatever it's going to be. But at the end of the day, because these things are fairly well built in, because they really don't try to mess with the matching criteria of the authentication rules, you can usually assume everything's pretty much as default. Things should match as you would normally expect to match based off of uh, a fairly standard install here. All right, so assuming, you know, based off of what rule it's matching, usually we're not going to alter what rules they match. We're just going to work with whatever rule they are matching and, and make sure that that rule allows what we need to allow. And so let's say that it hit the dot one x rule. What allowed protocols list does the dot one x rule use? This is going to control all of the protocols that are allowed when an authentication hits this rule. Again, we really only have one allowed protocols list. I've never really heard of a real, I've never really heard of the need in a lab to have to configure a separate allowed protocols list. There are small use cases for it, but by and large, one list is plenty fine for all, everything that we would do. So if we start looking at some of the, probably the common errors that we get around the allowed protocols list. Number one, we might get this error where the, if the protocol that they want to use is not allowed, in the allowed protocols list, you'll see fail to negotiate. In this case, it's an AO2.1x auth, so EEP, because PEEP is not allowed in the allowed protocols list. What this means is that the client tried to use PEEP, but in the allowed protocols list, PEEP is not turned on. A similar kind of an error would be for those tunneling protocols where the inner method is not allowed. So in this case, uh, we fix PEEP, so PEEP's allowed, but when they tried to do PEEP, the inner method that they attempted to use was MSChat v2. And so if that's not allowed, we see this fail to negotiate EEP for inner method because EEP MSChap is not allowed under PEEP. So now we know they tried to use PEEP with MSChap and that wasn't, the inner method wasn't allowed. So for any of those, you know, the protocol wasn't allowed, we look, okay, what allowed protocols list are we using? Default network access. All right, what is that configured for? Here's everything that's configured for. So the first error, you would have seen something to this effect where PEEP was just turned off. The second error, you would have seen something to this effect where PEEP was turned on, but the inner method was turned off. EFAST also has inner methods as well. So for things that have inner methods, there's the extra check that we have to go through. For things that uh, don't have you know, tunneling like LEAP, EEP TLS, you would just see something more like the first error with that. But that's how you would trace down, okay, we hit this rule. This rule uses this allowed protocols list. Look at that allowed protocols list and find what's turned off that needs to be turned on. Now, once you uh, use a protocol that is allowed, the next step is that the client will send its credentials up to the radio server. Now the radio server is going to use that identity store rule to say, where do I look to validate these credentials? And inside that authentication policy, we would be able to, you know, specify identity store sequence. We can identify individual policy, or sorry, identity stores themselves. We can also specify an identity uh, source result that's just a flat out deny, which is an interesting thing too. But what we want, again, we want to verify in the auth log, okay, it hit this rule and it hit this identity store rule if we ever had multiple identity store rules which is almost never the case but then based off of that you know are we looking in the right place and then the answer to that will tell you if we're looking in the right place maybe i just forgot to create the user account or the answer might be no we're not looking in the right place so let's go ahead and fix that so for instance here is what would be if we can't find the user so this is either we're not looking in the right place or we looked in the right place, but the account didn't get created or it didn't get created correctly. So subject not found in applicable identity stores, subject being the account. So again, what we, this isn't the end of it. We have to look, where, did, where was it looking? Was it looking in the correct place? So let's you know, pretend that we're hunting this down. So in my auth log, in this case, again, I hit the default authentication rule and the default identity store or sequence rule. I would have to, if I want to, I, I would have to look, okay, what is that, where is that looking? 
In this case, it's the all users identity stores, and we can see this over here. So the, the auth log actually can tip the hand as to where it was. Otherwise, you can just look at the, the configuration. So if we find the default rule with the default identity source sequence, we see, okay, we, we use the all user ID stores, which is kind of what we expected here. And now the question becomes, okay, how is that configured? Because that might be at its default configure, or they may have manipulated that. So you go to the identity source sequences. You look into it. Okay, now I know exactly where it's looking. So I can verify it this way. The log also verifies it. If we scroll down uh, a little bit further down, the log also tells us where we're looking. So we, we can find this information in a couple of different places. And we want to make sure, okay, the place I expect this account to be, are we looking there? If the answer is no, usually what usually we're looking in an identity source sequence and maybe we just didn't add what we needed. So by default, the, the all user identity store does not have internal endpoints in it. And maybe you actually wanted an internal endpoints in it. So you know, like an AP authorization that's using the default rule, but we're trying to validate a MAC address. So, you know, that's a real common place where you might see that error uh, just naturally occurring. Now, once you know that you are looking in the appropriate place, obviously it couldn't find it, so maybe it's internal users. All right, did, did I just forget to create the internal user? I thought I created it, maybe I just mistyped the, the username of the internal user. And so we head to where we believe that the user account should be. The only user repository that we generally configure would be an internal user. If we're using Active Directory, that should be 100% pre-configured for us with no manipulations on our part. So I would come in here and take a look. Okay, did I forget it? Is it there but just mistyped? It's going to be one of those things. And so you either add it or you fix it to match what the user account that the client is using. Because the client is hard-coded, you can't change it for, for an EAP WLAN authentication. Now for like a management authentication, yes, you are typing in a username. Maybe you mistyped the username as you logged in. And in the log, right up at the top, you see, okay, here's the user account that tried to connect. If it's something you had control over typing, yes, verify that you correctly typed that username in there. If you don't have control over it, this is the exact username that you need to make sure is in your list. And so if it's different here, you have to change it here. But that's how you would track down, okay, why couldn't it find it? Which identity source or identity source sequence was it using? Is that right? If not, fix it. Is the identity source sequence looking in the right places? If not, fix it. And is the user account where it belongs and is it spelled correctly? If not, fix it. Now, in this case, this is an error that we found the user account, but the password that the client provided is not the same as the password in the repository that we checked against, so wrong password. And again, um, if, the, if this was an 802.1x authentication where the AnyConnect client is pre-configured for the password, the only place we can fix this is in the user repository in ICE. If we had a hand at typing this in, maybe a management-based authentications, then we need to make sure that we correctly typed in that password. But at the end of the day, the password that is entered needs to match the password stored with the account in here. And so we see, again, we see the username and it should be fairly obvious where that account was. They usually tell you, well, this is an internal user. This is an Active Directory user or whatever it's going to be. But again, if you, if you just need to recurse it down in the top part here of the authentication details, we will see the authentication identity store where this user was found. It, this is different than the big old list that we found in the next section down, which says these are the places that we would look. So the one up on the top is the place where we found it. So this is the user account in question. We need to fix that user account's password in ICE, or we need to make sure that we typed it correctly, you know, in the, the management GUI or whatever it was.